Welcome to our last video in our series on vertebrate diversity. In this video, we're going to focus on our last class in the vertebrate subphylum, the mammals. One of the interesting things we're going to do in this group is look at the three subclasses of mammals, the monotremes, the marsupials, and the placentals. But before we do that, before we look at this diversity, let's focus on the general characteristics of all mammals. What are the defining characteristics? Um, there are a few characteristics that are certainly are defining of mammals, and then one characteristic that is the defining. But let's start with the obvious one, hair. All mammals have hair. When we look at hair, uh, it's a derivative of the skin. It's formed by the skin. It's made of keratin, which incidentally it makes the is the same protein that makes the scales of reptiles and the birds uh, birds feathers which suggest um, that hair uh, evolved from scales uh, as, as did feathers. The next characteristic that we have that's defining of mammals is the presence of skin glands. Uh, mammals have scent glands, sebaceous glands, which are oil glands associated with hair follicles, sweat glands, and finally, the defining characteristics of the group mammals, mammary glands, which produce milk. Mammals are the only animals that can sustain their young by feeding them from nourishment of their own body. That's pretty interesting. Let's take a closer look at these skin glands. If we zoom into this diagram, we can see that here's a hair follicle, and associated with that follicle is a sebaceous gland. It produces oil. That oil gland uh, lubricates the hair as it moves out, uh, and also so that hair is covered in oil, which gives our skin, and then the oil is also on our skin, which gives our skin a, a waterproofing because only the oils are lipids, and lipids uh, repel water. We also see in this diagram a uh, sweat gland, and the sweat is uh, an excretion organ which gets rid of water to the surface, also ammonia and some salts, but as the sweat goes onto the surface of the skin, it evaporates, all, uh, evaporates away, which helps cool the body, so that's going to play a role in temperature regulation. It's also a derivative of the skin. Now, I don't have a picture of uh, scent glands, but let's look at mammary glands. Uh, obviously, the mammary glands, again, are uh, uniquely mammalian. That's where the name comes from. Uh, and there are these uh, glands that are in the skin that produce milk, uh, which can then be secreted out of the body to nourish the young. And both uh, male and female uh, mammals have mammary glands, but it's just the females uh, where the hormone levels are at uh, such a level that um, they actually produce, uh, th these glands are active and produce the milk. The next characteristic that we see in all mammals is a complex brain with convolutions. When we look at the mammal brain, it's pretty unique. Uh, convolutions are folds. You see all these uh, folds that kind of look like spaghetti in here. When you look at the brain of a fish or a reptile or an amphibian and even a bird, this part of the brain called the cerebrum is actually smooth. It doesn't have all these folds. And in the evolution of animals and the evolution of mammals, uh, the size of the cerebrum, the top part of the brain that does the higher level uh, processing, um, was growing, but the size of the brain case uh, didn't grow as fast, and so it, in order to fit as much brain uh, in the smaller space, it, the brain had to kind of fold in on itself, and so we see this very um, um, typical mammalian brain with these folds. That's, uh, like I said, indicative only, or only found in uh, mammals' brains. That when we look overall at the um, vertebrates, that it's the, the mammals that have the, the larger brains and the uh, better uh, sensory and nervous systems. The next characteristic that's uniquely mammalian is complex dentition, or teeth. When we talked about birds, we said the shape of the beak indicates the type of food the bird can eat. But when you look at the teeth of mammals, we also see some pretty interesting things. Um, it's only in mammals that we have this differentiation of teeth, uh, where we have the incisors up here for cutting and the canines for grabbing and puncturing and the, the premolars and then the molars, which have the flat grinding surfaces. And different types of mammals will have a different distribution of these varied teeth. I mean, if you looked at sharks, all their teeth are basically the same, or, a, or a, maybe a crocodile. They're all just sharp, but this um, uh, f different functionality of different types of feet, teeth, this differentiation is, is, is uniquely mammalian. But if you look at the teeth of a carnivore, you're going to see a lot more of the incisors and canines and less uh, surface for the grinding teeth that you'd find. Uh, but an herbivore, an animal that was um, eating a vegetable matter only, you'd have, you wouldn't need these sharp canines and incisors, but you'd have a more emphasis on the large grinding flat molars and premolars. So if you look at the jaw of a, of a 
of a mammal and, and investigate the teeth, you should be able to figure out uh, the basic type of feeder that that animal is. Uh, we as humans are omnivores, so we have the full range of teeth for eating both meat and uh, vegetable matter. The next characteristic we can look at are the well-developed lungs with the diaphragm. The mammalian, and the mammalian lung is well developed, they have good gas exchange. It's not as efficient as the birds with the extra air sacs, but uh, it's pretty efficient. And we have a muscle down here underneath the lungs that's called the diaphragm. And it's the diaphragm that controls the breathing. And this is its shape where it's uh, kind of bowed like this. This is when it's relaxed. When this muscle contracts and gets smaller, it drops down. And as it drops down, it creates negative pressure which sucks air down into the lungs. Uh, we call this negative pressure breathing and we can contrast that with the positive pressure breathing we saw in the amphibians but this is a well-developed lung we have good gas exchange uh, like I said not as efficient as the birds which had the extra air sacs but efficient nonetheless now these characteristics are uniquely mammalian um, and draw that the way I wanted to um, but the next couple of characteristics that we're going to look at are shared by other animals um, but they are still characteristics that all mammals share but these are the ones that are uniquely mammal let's briefly talk about maternal care that we see in the mammals like I said other animals will exhibit um, maternal care but uh, in the mammals that maternal care takes on a different nature obviously with mammals having mammary glands and nursing their young this uh, connection between the mother and the offspring is much more intimate and, and uh, important uh, the interesting thing oh, is the length of the maternal care uh, it, kind of interesting it seems to be that the larger the animal the longer this maternal care lasts. So for maybe a rodent, a rodent um, the mother only takes care of the young for maybe a matter of like a weeks, um, but for the elephants, for example, it may be um, many, many years. And of course, in humans, it takes on a whole different type of relationship where it can be, uh, you know, many, many, many years. Next, let's look at the circulatory system. Now, with the birds, we already had our four-chambered heart. In fact, if we go back to the crocodilians and the reptiles, we had a four-chambered heart. And the mammals do also. And so I just put our diagram that we had from our earlier videos up here. And we can see the basic circulation in a schematic diagram. But if we want to look at what a mammalian heart looks like uh, in a little more detail, this is a, a more... Um, um, accurate more realistic representation of what the human heart or mammalian heart looks like and so we see that the uh, right atrium would receive uh, deoxygenated blood from the body from the top and bottom of the body and pump that into the right ventricle and then the right ventricle will pump that blood through the pulmonary arteries to the pulmonary loop uh, to the two lungs and then oxygen rich blood would return from the lungs into the left atrium from both sides this wraps around the back and from the right atrium to the right ventricle and then the right ventricle pumps the blood out to the systemic loop or out to the body we'll talk more about the heart in our unit on the uh, circulatory system when we do anatomy and finally all mammals are endothermic they generate and regulate their own body temperature through through their meta met metabolism. Their high metabolic rate will generate heat and then the hair that all mammals have plays a role in keeping them warm. Now some of the marine uh, mammals don't have as much hair but they do have a thick layer of fat called blubber and so hair or in fat help trap the heat uh, making them good endotherms. Uh, so that's the warming up but we also have to cool down and, and uh, mammals have some pretty interesting physiological means to uh, cool down and I have done another video on temperature regulation in the anatomy and physiology unit and you can check that out if you want to see more of that. But mammals are endotherms so they can live in a broad range of habitat so there are general mammal characteristics now, what we have left to do is to look at these three subgroups in the mammals and see what makes each of these subclasses the monotremes the marsupials and the placentals different from each other we need to see what's the basis of this division and it turns out it has to do with the reproductive event or the birth event so the basis of division between the subclasses of the mammals is reproduction all mammals have internal fertilization, uh, but the length of the time that the embryo is held in the female's body is uh, called gestation, and that's very different from the different groups. So, let's look at our first subclass, the monotremes. The monotremes are the egg-laying mammals. We don't think of, anim of mammals laying eggs, but they do. And the egg that they lay is um, kind of reptilian. It's a leathery egg rather than a hard-shelled egg. So, 
um, more of like the reptile egg than the bird egg. And, but when the young are hatched from these eggs, they still nurse like all mammals do from the mammary glands of the mother. Now the only kind of uh, examples of the monotremes that we know of are the spiny anteater or the echidna and the duckbill platypus. This egg is an amniotic egg, so it has the same um, extra embryonic membranes that we see in the bird egg or the reptile egg, the amnion, the allantois, the chorion, and the yolk sac, uh, nutrients, uh, gas exchange, um, waste um, disposal, and a protective uh, fluid filled sac. Um, so they have an egg. Now let's move on to the marsupials. The marsupials are our pouched mammals. They, um, they, when their babies are born, they're born extremely underdeveloped, kind of premature. And the reason for that is they have a small yolk sac uh, for their embryo, but there's no, it's not very large, and they don't lay an egg. So when the yolk sac is used up, they're born, and they finish their development in their mother's pouch. So they're born, they're just not fully formed. Uh, they finish their development inside the pouch, and so we have kangaroos and koala and possum. Uh, there are some, there are other uh, marsupials, but that's a pretty good uh, a list to know. Um, but the key is that when they're born, uh, they're born premature because they've used up the nutrient material they have uh, around them in, in the uterus and they have to finish their development. They'll, they'll climb up into the pouch and attach to the teat and suckle and nurse and finish their development uh, uh, in the pouch. So now we can move on to the placental mammals. Now, in the placentals, the babies are born fully developed. They have all their parts. They're ready to go. Now, they may not be able to care for each, uh, themselves yet, but they are fully uh, formed. Now, the key to that is the structure of the placenta. So we need to talk about what the placenta is and, and what it's doing uh, that the other mammals don't have. So if we draw some pictures here, and so I'm going to draw uh, a little embryo. So here's my embryo, and it's inside the uterus, and it's surrounded, of course, by the amnion, the fluid-filled sac that all amniotes have around them. Now, instead of having a yolk sac, the placental animals have a structure called the placenta. It's an extension of the baby's body. Uh, you'd think an umbilical cord from where your belly button is, and this tissue comes out here, and it attaches to the wall of the mother's uterus. And this placenta uh, is uh, got lots of folds in it, and it grows right into the wall of the mo the uterine lining of the mother. And this placenta is vascularized, meaning there's blood vessels from the baby that run out in here. And these blood vessels that are in this placenta uh, allow for exchanges between the baby's body and the mother's body. The uterine lining is also highly vascularized, but the one thing to know here is that the mother's blood and the baby's blood never mix. There are just exchanges made back and forth from the mother's blood, uh, nutrients and antibodies and other things that the baby needs, oxygen, and from the baby's blood into the mother's blood, waste products and carbon dioxide. So as these exchanges are being made, nutrients and oxygen and antibodies can cross over. Uh, unfortunately, so can poisons such as alcohol and drugs can also pass across this, this, um, this divide between the mother's blood and the baby's blood and feed the, the embryo. And the waste products can be passed out. So the placenta takes over the job of certain embryonic membranes that we saw in the amniotic egg. We no longer need the chorion for gas exchange. The placenta does that. We no longer need the uh, allantois for waste uh, storage because the waste can be uh, removed to the mother's blood and the mother's body can get rid of those wastes. And we no longer need the yolk sac for nutrients because the mother is feeding the baby uh, across from her blood nutrients to the baby's blood. So there are three divisions and the basis of those divisions within mammals. So I thought we'd, with the time we have left, we'd just run through some of the diversity within the placentals because we're placentals. Now I know this is a lot of typed words on a, a TV screen and that's, or a computer screen, and that's a lot to read, but uh, let's just look at this. Within the subclass placentals, we have a lot of different orders, and this is not all of them. Um, these are the, just the ones you have to memorize. Uh, kind of kidding about that. But, you know, these are ones that you should be a little bit familiar with. These aren't uh, things that should be too unusual for you. Uh, we have the rodents and the lagomorpha, which include the rabbits, the chiroptera, the flying mammals, the bats, 
order cetacea and think sea cetacea the swimming uh, some of the swimming the dolphins and the whales the swimming mammals and we need to address that uh, mammals are terrestrial animals the evolution of the dolphins and whales represents a movement back to water these are uh, air breathing uh, with lungs uh, mammals um, and so it, it's interesting that, that somewhere in evolution they return to water, but uh, we've been terrestrial ever since the uh, reptiles. Uh, the serenia with the manatee, and if you've ever seen manatee in the wild, the word serene or calm is a ap appropriate uh, term for them. So, And then the carnivora, which are all the cats, lions, and bears. Insectivora, uh, Edentata, the armadillos. We're here in Texas. We have lots of armadillos. Uh, the order Periodactyla and Arteriodactyla, the are hooved animals. Uh, the difference here is odd toed. By odd, usually the number one. One is an odd number. If you think of a horse footprint, it looks like this, as opposed to a deer uh, footprint, which has kind of a has two toes or even toed. The proboscia means proboscis means nose. The elephants with their long snouts, and then the primates. So let's look at some pictures real quick, just for the cuteness factor. We have our rodents and our lagomorphas, our chiroptera, the bats, the uh, sirenia, the manatee, and the cetacea, the dolphin. Uh, on this page, we have our carnivora, the cats and the dogs and the bears, the canines and the um, I don't know the order name for these guys, uh, but they're awful cute. And then we have our insectivores and our armadillos, our edentata, our hooved animals, the odd toed uh, and the even toed uh, hooved animals, the mammals, the proboscia, the elephants, and finally the primates. And this one went a little long, this video, but um, I hope that you got a good overview of the subclass mammals. And that is our last video in our series on vertebrate diversity. We worked our way up from the other chordates, the subphyla of chordata, uh, through the vertebrates uh, and all the way up to mammals. And then within mammals, uh, we ended with primates.